Welcome to a very special and timely episode of Inside Medical Malpractice. Today we're going to discuss the interesting and somewhat disturbing phenomenon in research that's shown that being admitted or discharged to hospital during Christmas can be risky. With the holiday season approaching, no doubt the hospital is the last place you want to be, not only because you'd rather be spending this time with your family and friends, but because being admitted or discharged at this time of year carries some increased risk. Research has shown that patients are more likely to have bad outcomes, including more frequent injuries, readmission to hospital, and even death. It's well known among ER physicians that heart attack patients admitted during the holidays don't fare as well as patients admitted during other times of the year. A University of Toronto researchers have called this the Christmas effect, which echoes some earlier studies that note a July effect, a weekend effect, and a holiday effect, where patients fare worse during these periods. The theory, which has been dubbed the July effect, holds that this influx of inexperience of new medical doctors coming on staff, combined with a mass turnover of staff, can be dangerous. In some of the more rigorous studies, and depending on what research paper you read, the risk of death in July increases somewhere between 4 and 12% at teaching hospitals with young medical residents who are just coming on board starting their practicum. One study of British hospitals found that patients seen on the week after the new medical residents started were 6% more likely to die than those seen in the week before. We're going to talk about both a couple of these different times today. I want to first start with the July effect. My own mom suffered a very, very serious injury when she was hospitalized over the July 1st weekend. She was just two days post-op from knee replacement surgery, and my sister had stayed with her all day on this particular day, which happened to be July 1st. She stayed until 10 p.m. because my mom was so loopy on the drugs, and we were so concerned about her behavior that she spoke to the nurses before she left saying, please keep an eye on her and don't give her any more drugs, just keep your eyes on her. She couldn't even keep her eyes open long enough to finish the sentence, and she was so confused. And um, we were concerned, we were really concerned. But shortly after my sister went home, the very young and brand new shiny night nurse whose shift started at 11 o'clock, popped into my mom's room and said, Margaret, get up, it's Canada Day and the fireworks are about to start. And you can see them really, really well from the patient lounge. And then she left the room. And my mom, being the person that she is, got up to go and try to see the fireworks. And she started to the lounge, but she fainted before she even got out of her room. She fell hard on the floor and cracked her head open. And she lay there on that floor for at least 45 minutes until the fireworks were over. When the nurses found her, they said they had never before seen so much blood. They think she, they estimated that she lost at least three liters and she'd lain so long on the floor in the same position and fallen so hard that the pattern of the floor tiles, including the grout and all the little squares were imprinted and bruised into her face. That night she had a CT scan. She had three units of pack cells for blood. They had to put 38 staples in her face and scalp. And she still suffers from some neurological side effects from that fall. I honestly don't think that this particular injury had anything to do with the changeover of medical students, as is famous in the July effect, but it's certainly consistent with a serious injury over a holiday weekend. But to be fair, as we talk about all this, the Christmas effect and the July effect, placing the blame of poor outcomes solely on hospitals and healthcare providers may not accurately reflect the entire picture. Many patients put off healthcare appointments during this time because of travel or family obligations or just fun. Nobody wants to spend time in a waiting room during the holidays, whether it's a doctor's office or a clinic or the ER. And more recently, the increased risk of exposure to COVID has kept many people away from crowded healthcare facilities. But regardless of the cause and regardless of the reason, the bottom line remains that outcomes are worse. 
The reason I'm opening with this information today is that I was a nursing expert who testified in a trial with our today's guest, Barb Leggett. This particular case involved the serious injury of a newborn in a special care nursery on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And we're going to talk, among other things, about that particular case and how this Christmas effect and staffing played a role in the outcome in that case. Before we start, again, to be fair to everybody, there are two lines of thought regarding the phenomenon which has been dubbed the Christmas effect. One is patient-centered and the other is hospital-centered. The patient-centered rationale proposes that people tend to have more serious illnesses during the winter. There are harsh weather conditions that lead to flu and colds and respiratory illnesses and currently COVID, which in turn leads to poor outcomes among some already fragile individuals. Holidays can be particularly problematic for people with chronic health conditions. And let's not forget that outside of hospital admission for childbirth, the most common admissions to hospital are for heart problems, digestive issues, and respiratory infections, all of which can be exacerbated over the winter months and the holiday season. It's also well known that people indulge in riskier behaviors that compromise their health over holiday seasons. This might be smoking more, drinking more, consuming too many rich, sweet, fatty foods, sitting around more. I'm guilty of most of those things. And there's also the issue of the emotional stretch, stressors and dysfunctional situations, which can potentiate the likely, likelihood of stress-related illness. But then on the flip side, there's the hospital-centered rationale for the uh, poorer outcomes. And this rationale looks at things and proposes that even though hospitals must remain open around the clock, they do slow down or close some of their vital services over the weekend. There are several reasons for this. Staffing during holidays can be thinner, lighter. On top of that, um, the hospital staff with the most seniority often get the bonus of getting to pick their vacations first. They're more likely to get Christmas and holidays off and younger staff will take over for them. They're more likely to choose winter holidays at peak times, and this does leave the less experienced staff man in the show and running the hospital during the holiday season. Fewer and less experienced staff co coverage can not only compromise care, it can result in longer wait times and delays in access to all care. Some of the needed diagnostic testing, such as pathology reports, CT scans, MRI scans, may not be available or only be available on a limited basis during holidays. This can lead to delays in diagnosis and treatment, which can sometimes have catastrophic consequences. Often, too, social workers, home care services, and community support are not available during the holidays or they're available on a very limited basis. And this does not facilitate appropriate discharge. Access to care, continuity of care, and coordination of care matter even more sometimes during the holidays. So today we're going to start by talking to Barb Leggett about this fascinating malpractice case that happened over Christmas. And then we're going to talk to her about many other things because she's a very experienced lawyer who has many things, a wealth of knowledge to share with us. But before we get started talking, let me just tell you a little bit about her awesomeness, and then we're going to dive into some questions. Barb Leggett is a very experienced plaintiff's lawyer and the principal of Leggett Injury Lawyers, a medical malpractice and personal injury firm in Ontario. She's been delivering justice for four decades pioneering malpractice, negligence, and personal injury settlements with a goal of securing a brighter future for her clients. She does this by advocating on behalf of injured and misdiagnosed children, family, and adults, by mentoring other lawyers and sharing successful represent representation best practices. She demonstrates leadership within the legal community through her publications and speaking. She secures compensation and better futures for people across Ontario. I happen to know Barb and know people who know her and know that she has a stellar reputation in the field of practice where she chooses to work. She's especially passionate about representing children who are injured by negligence. As a mother and a grandmother, she can emphasize with her clients on a level that not everyone can. It's a labor of love for her, she says, and she leads a team of knowledgeable lawyers who are just as committed as she is. 
The tagline on her website, which I love, is called Your Future is Her Why. I think that's just a great way to say what she does. And knowing her, I think that describes exactly what she does and how she does it. Just a few of Barb's lifetime accomplishments include Best Lawyers of the Year 2021, past president of the Ontario Trialers Association, and she was the first woman ever to hold this position, Children's Health Foundation Board of Directors. She's a specialist in civil litigation with the Law Society since 1996, and she was only the ninth woman in Ontario to receive this designation. She was appointed to the Law Society of Ontario Civil Rules Community, and she's the originator and chair of Leggett's Medical Negligence Moot Court at Western University. I know that this is just a small snapshot of what she's going on, of what she's got going on. Uh, with four decades of work, I know she's done so much, much more. But welcome, Barb. I'm so very happy to have you on the podcast today. Well, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction, Chris. And thank you very much for the invitation. As I said, this is my first time, and um, I'm really delighted to be here. Well, I'm also delighted. I've always known you'd make a great guest. You're a very articulate speaker, but I think you also have a lovely, down-to-earth, relatable um, personality and way of speaking. And I really was have ever been, we've, since we were involved together in this trial, um, you know, this the fact that it happened over Christmas in a hospital, in a teaching hospital, with this little baby, uh, basically in an incubator, like all eyes on the whole baby all the time, has just never left my mind in how the, you know, how the Christmas part of it played into it. So this happened in 20, 000, 2017, and you ran a medical malpractice trial called Biasi v. Singh. I'd like to just hear from you, from your perspective, the story. And if you could include with us some of the what the standard of care and causation issues were, how and why you felt this case went all the way to trial and I believe appeal, and tell us what you can about the outcome. Okay, so um, if I told you about every single standard of care issue in this case as it um, as it unfolded, I think that would take up the entirety of the of the podcast. But. Um, the one that was ultimately litigated was a nursing standard of care and the duty to report to a physician. And that, uh, that, that didn't actually go to the Court of Appeal. The issue that ended up going to the Court of Appeal was causation. And if the nurse had met the standard of care, would that have made a difference? But this case was one, because it was litigated over Christmas and it was a babe who had a C-section, a rough start, so there was perinatal care and maybe something was missed there. There were blood tests that were ordered and interpreted by a, um, uh, a hematologist and there was an issue about whether the report was sufficient to alert the physicians in the NICU about this child. And then was there continuity of information going from one person to the next about just what a rough start this babe had um, and were the, uh, were the um, residents uh, evaluating the care of this, this uh, baby sufficiently? Were they going off on tangents? And then there, the, the baby, this baby starts out, you know, perinatal care was a problem then in the NICU, um, maybe not interpreting the blood, uh, blood test right, but then getting transferred to the nursery. And unfortunately, the transfer to the nursery was around day four of life. And that's when we can expect to start to see yellowing and jaundice. So um, what happened there is I think one of the problems, and, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but this cognitive bias of, oh, I know what this is. This is just regular jaundice and not really thinking through the rough road this little baby had to get to day four of life. So when the, the child became uh, yellow, it was not reported to a physician. And at that point in time, and I know across Canada, this is probably universally changed, nurses can order um, a bilirubin test on their own and that's what you do to 
evaluate jaundice. So she didn't order one. She didn't report anything to a physician, um, cared for this baby overnight. Um, and this all happened on Boxing Day um, <clears throat> and uh, Boxing Day night. So the baby is day four of life, uh, day three of life on Christmas Day, day four of life on Boxing Day and Boxing Day morning when you'd expect everybody be chit-chatting about what happened the day before, yet another turnover of staff, yet another set of residents, new nurses, um, morning blood work's done and this baby's through the roof with uh, his bilirubin levels. So this case came to me from another experienced lawyer who felt that was a bit over his head. So when we took it over, we took a look and had to add a lot of people just to get the picture complete um, and make sure that we looked at all the pieces because we then had um, the perinatal care, the uh, NICU care, the nursery care, the overnight care, and then the morning and what happened and how long it took someone to, to come to grips with this um, very serious condition. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, jaundice seems like, oh, that's what babies get. Well, that's um, physiologic. Yep, there's a little bit of time for, I guess, your liver to ramp up and become effective. And in the meantime, there might be some yellowing. But it can also be pathologic. And that's what this child had. And it wasn't recognized as such. And it can be pathologic because of the your, your little body having um, all kinds of things going on that this little guy did, and it just wasn't recognized. So the, the case, when it went to trial, um, had a cast of thousands. <laughs> there, it was supposed to go for 11 weeks. Um, it was supposed to have 13 physician defendants, nurses, um, it had the hospital and that's how it got going. So um, when it started, it was one that I thought was um, going to exhaust me and uh, it was going to, uh, it, it was going to be very difficult. I very, very experienced and good counsel on the other side. But in the first week of trial, um, we did, uh, we, we had some very, very good luck and very, very good talent in our nursing uh, testimony. Chris mentioned that she testified for me in this case, and they put her through the ringer. First of all, she wasn't qualified to testify. Well, yes, she was. Um, then uh, th th there were all sorts of things thrown at her. We had a what's called a voir dire, which means the judge hears about her qualifications first and there's challenges and, and written reasons were given that I hope that Chris has framed and um, recognizes as a real feather in her cap. I have framed and, and kept them, although I do remember two days there waiting for that judgment as being sort of hellish. It was <laughs> it, for all of us. I agree. Um, <laughs> So anyway, that, that we got through that part, and then she was able to testify, and basically it was yellow baby report, and let the doctor figure it out. Um, that's the, what was the standard at the time. And the defense was that, no, the, the nurse can use her judgment, and she doesn't have to call all the time, and they'd be in trouble if they were calling all the time. So um, we were fortunate enough to to find and call to testify the nurse who was on before the nurse who saw the jaundice. And that nurse was pretty clear. Yep, hospital expects me to call the doctor. I can't do that. See yellow baby, call doctor. That was it. And, and she was pretty unshakable in that testimony. And it was completely consistent with what Chris had to say. So at the end of that week, which was quite tumultuous, um, and they tried to get in testimony that I hadn't heard of before. It was during the, the course of the trial and we had to fight that off. And I, that was a, that was a big to do, um, great big motion in the middle of the trial and the Super Bowl was on. 
Um, and the other lawyer got mad because Super Bowl is on a Sunday night and we're beavering away, getting everything ready for this, <laughs> which was actually his motion. We knew it was coming and responding to it. And he was mad that we were prepared and he wasn't because he watched the Super Bowl. Anyway, and that, I remember that one really well. That was the Super Bowl that was really two separate games. Um, and and uh, so that was successful. And we kept out um, the late breaking evidence that would have been uh, from a nurse manager and a nurse educator. Heretofore, we'd asked for that and it was didn't exist, but all of a sudden when the evidence went in very badly for them, it existed again. So that was kept out. And I don't know what they would have had to say. Um, so uh, at the end of all of that, we thought, you know what? The, the case against the nurses is very, very good. It's very strong. So uh, we decided to let out the 13 doctors and just proceed. And I think that at the end of the day, by the time we had the causation evidence and the evidence of the defendant, we'd taken an 11 week trial and it was, it was litigated maybe over three weeks, but maybe, I, I don't remember how many trial days, but maybe between five and seven trial days, mm. it was mm. very, very compressed. And the result was a win. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah, that was quite a case. Um, it really was. And, and, you know, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but from a nursing perspective, it was just so obvious. Um, but I do remember you shared with me that that nurse that you'd found, the, the nurse from the hospital, and she just said, you see a yellow baby, you call a doctor. And for all my blah, 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 my 20 page report, she really just basically distilled it down to one perfect line, <laughs> which of course was what I'd been trying to say. But I said, she said it so much more perfectly and eloquently and succinctly. And that actually solidified my own, you know, feeling of testimony and understanding, like after all that questioning, whether I was even qualified to testify, which shakes your rock a little bit. That was really, um, that helped me a lot too, to just say, I, damn right, of course, that's it. In its simplest form, that's what it's always been. That's what it will always be. And that's what it was for this particular case. I'm just going to take two seconds and go backwards for the non-medical audience that might be listening in. You and I know the details of this case very well, but I'm just going to do a brief discussion on jaundice and cernicterus because of the issues that happened in this case. Um, jaundice, I think most of us will know that many new babies, up to 50% of newborn babies, do get some level of yellowing of the skin or jaundice. And um, that is very common because babies are born with a lot of red blood cells. They're bright red, ruddy colors when they're born. And as that excess bilirubin, which has been produced, breaks down, um, our, the red, cells, red blood cells break down. Bilirubin is a byproduct and it causes staining and yellowing of the skin. It's normal, usually with some extra breastfeeding and fluids. Um, and three or four or five days, it just resolves on its own. But certain babies who either have pathologic conditions or a higher level of risk factors, and we'll discuss those quickly, jaundice can turn into a much, much more serious condition called cernicterus. Um, it, it is, I want to say right off the top, considered fully preventable or nearly always preventable because you can watch the yellowing of the skin, the yellowing of the whites of the eyes, the yellowing of the forehead, and sometimes the mucous membranes. You can test for it, and there's readily available treatments in the form of um, light, bilirubin lights, extra fluids, sometimes blood transfusion and other things. It's um, often the babies are not just kind of sleepy and lethargic. They get sick looking you know they have a poor suck reflex they might have a high-pitched cry they get respiratory distress and when it's really advanced they get tenseness of the fontanelles in the brain and the injury happens when the bilirubin level becomes so high that it crosses the blood brain barrier and causes brain damage cernicterus i think in its oldest form means yellow brain and that's bilirubin has gotten into the brain and infants who develop severe cernicterus sometimes die. And if they survive, they often have seizure disorders, they have eye gaze issues, they have hearing loss, they have intellectual deficits, they have dental dysplasias. This particular baby, um, you were talking about the risk and the tough time this little one had, was um, had lots of stuff going on, according to the um, 
uh, American and Canadian Association of Pediatrics, which have guidelines to watch for high-risk babies with jo to, to develop serious connectoris. Um, this baby had super high bilirubin in the hospital. Um, you know, when you talk about issues with the perinatal care, he seemed to have been delivered a little too early for a book C-section. He was kind of in a 35 to 36 week range when normally it's ideal to be closer to the 38, nine week range. And I'm not sure how that happened. He'd had two previous siblings. He had two older brothers, this little one, who had both had jaundice and one of them had required phototherapy. Um, for reasons which aren't quite explained, there was quite a bit of bruising on this baby at the time of delivery. I don't know if it was a deliberate, a, a, difficult C-section extraction, and he was also of an East Asian race. Um, and so all of the, his mother was also greater than 25, and he was a baby boy. He was male gender. So all of those things on top of his already 50% chance of uh, getting jaundice, he had these additional risk factors which added up. So the goal, you know, from the nursing perspective was to do this risk assessment. And I understand from what you said that maybe this wasn't done. Nobody kind of put this whole picture together of the tough gig that had happened with this little one before it happened. Um, to, but to identify those risks and then your eyes are wide open and your level of assessments are high and you have a high suspicion, just watching for this to happen. And I think both of us felt at the end of the case that that was a fall down in this case. They didn't really understand how high risk this baby was. He also had um, some findings of, um, like you mentioned, respiratory distress and some pneumonia. And uh, yeah, it was a fascinating case for me because they all are. I get to speak to people like you and neonatologists. And I spoke to some of the, and, and obtained reports from some of the, um, stellar uh, and uh, most uh, talented and knowledgeable people in the world about conicterus and its prevention. It, it was called a never event. It should never happen. It's, there's guidelines, there's how, how early the baby's born, how big the baby is, how, you know, what it can tolerate in terms of bilirubin levels. Um, I learned that doctors uh, order blood tests that give them results that they don't understand. Um, that there's something called your RDW, and I now know what that is, and I'm going to bet that um, because I've asked several doctors since in, in the context of examinations for discovery, they don't know what it is. They don't know how it applies to a child, but um, sometimes you think with the experts that you call at a trial that testify for you at a trial know so much um, and are the teachers that that uh, they know all this stuff. They know what, uh, what, the, what this is all about. And maybe just the ordinary physician doesn't know. But this did take place at a teaching hospital, a tertiary level, uh, a ter tertiary level facility. But getting back to your Christmas theme, this was a planned C-section on December 22nd, which was a Friday. I don't know what you can conclude from that. Um, but I had my suspicions. Uh, you, you do have to wonder why was this so early? Why couldn't it wait till Monday? Oh, that would have been, or, you know, New Year's Eve or whatever. It, it, it just seemed to me to be um, an unusual choice for a birthday. I would agree. This baby was, you know, at 36 and a half weeks is, unless there's a reason, a complication, where the baby's safer outside the uterus than in, um, I would agree there's something. There was something off there we can't really tell. Um, and how, you know, like in hindsight, I mean, to me, this case always seemed really obvious, like, boom, this shouldn't happen. This is a never event. He's, this little one's in the hospital, had all the stuff, you know, uh, he should have needed around. And the test for bilirubin is simple and easy and frequently done. And technically, at the time, has all or technically has always needed a medical order. But um, in real life practice, nurses very, very often will see a yellow baby and order a bilirubin, and then call the doctor and say, uh, "This kid was yellow, and so we've ordered a bilirubin, and here what it here's what it is." So, you know, the issue of access to medical care in this particular case 
wasn't an issue as far as I'm concerned. It didn't end up in the end being an issue because the next morning, the nurse who did order the bilirubin when it was astronomically high, she didn't check with the doctor. She just did it. I mean, that's kind of how it's done. But how, so, you know, with some of the obvious, in my perspective, issues with the case and what in the end ended up being some obvious issues that were brought out and it wrapped up quite quickly, like you said, in three weeks, but really only four or five days of testimony. Why did this case go all the way to trial? Why did it go all the way to trial? I, there's, there's some interesting strategic things that went on in the background. One of the um, things that I find in litigating cases with uh, doctors and where hospitals are involved is the hospital will very often take the position, well, the doctors are in charge, so we take a back seat. And it's almost like they go, well, you know, if we hide, nobody's going to really target us. But this was a case where the, the team environment was really very, very important to the outcome of the case. So I did like the actual outcome of the case, the failure to, to act as a team. But the hospital did the usual, and that was let the doctors get all the experts lined up, let the doctors pay for this one and that one and the other one, and develop the case uh, completely and they did most of the examination of the witnesses um, that is the before examination of the witnesses so when we got to trial um, the, the doctors had some potential outs because of the nursing conduct so when we got to trial um, my concern was that the doctors, if they called all their testimony, would erode and undermine what happened in the case against the hospital. So that's why I let them out after your very excellent testimony and this other nurse who came through um, with the yellow baby call a doctor uh, testimony and the fact that, the, the, as you pointed out, the, the nurse in the morning saw a yellow baby and asked for the test. Um, so that's one reason. But the other reason that has nothing to do with standard of care is causation. So what if she'd have called the doctor uh, or a resident when she saw the yellow baby? What difference would that have made? And very often these cases that seem obvious on standard of care are less obvious when it comes to causation. And that was um, always a problem in the, in the case or a challenge. Um, so that, and that became the issue that went to the Court of Appeal. That is, if they'd have done the Billy Rubin test at that point, but, and because they didn't, we didn't know what the Billy Rubin level would be. So um, not knowing what the Billy Rubin level is, you can't des demonstrate that it would have sounded any alarm bells. So the doctors had to go backward. The theory of the hospital was um, that, you know, jaundice, usually is on this exponential curve, but maybe because this child was particularly vulnerable, ironically, they took that position, that it went, it would have shot up on a different trajectory. And so you really can't work backward from, from the, uh, all, uh, the first result. So that was um, writ large what the, the case was actually I think most challenging about, although I have to say that the cross-examination of the defense expert, nursing expert was probably some of the most fun I've ever had. Um, when Let's I, hear about that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as one of the people on the other side uh, that was there for the hospital said to me later, you know, sometimes nurses just want to be helpful. That's sort of why you get into nursing. And they were trying to, this particular witness was trying to be helpful to the person who she was testifying on behalf of, and it backfired. Mm. So much so that I remember thinking, you know, there's, there's so much you prepare for as a medical negligence lawyer when you're, you're about to cross-examine someone. And it can be very intimidating because people will come up with, the expert will come up with something that you don't expect. And one of the things that um, uh, I was cross-examining about was the fact that this baby wasn't drinking very much overnight and that that was concerning. And you know, let's remember this baby is four days old and has not been starved. The hospital has been feeding this, this, this child 
um, through a nasogastric tube. And she said, well, you wouldn't expect him to have very much that number of milliliters because their, their little tummies are the size of a walnut at that, at that time. And I looked at her and said, but has he been fed since the time he was born? Oh, yeah. And doesn't his stomach, isn't his stomach expected to grow over this period of time and he would be taking in larger amounts of fluid? Yes. You just made that up, didn't you? to help out your and and she basically yeah said yeah i just made that up um so <laughs> that was that was a lot of fun uh whoops <laughs> yeah yeah she, she agreed that she just made it up and that testimony <laughs> was so devastating that it got reproduced in the judgment uh, yeah and the other lawyer said it was painful listening to the first time through it was at least as painful reading it again in the judgment oh yeah i believe it I, yeah. I've never actually had the courage to go back and read through any of my judgments, only just kind of the final, because you're just like, oh, man, you just hope, you just hope, you just hope you didn't say anything that was deadly or stupid or wrong or, you know, based on, you know, it's just, it's just terrifying to go back in its own way. But, um, you know, I'm not that learning, though, when you do go back and read your yeah. own testimony. Yeah. For sure. And I've always appreciated feedback from the lawyers uh, like you that I've gone to trial with, like, just give it to me straight. Like, <laughs> how bad was that? Or how good was it? Where was I strong? Where was I weak? What could I have done better? I certainly do try to always get that kind of feedback. But, um, you know, this, I remember this as being a pretty tough case um, to be to testify in. And I was, you know, raked over the coals, as you said. Um, so it was kind of stressful, but I was so glad at the end of the day. I mean, I'm not the judge or the jury, but I really felt that this was the right outcome for this particular case. It just yeah. actually blows my mind that that little one was there in an incubator in a special care nursery, naked, even like just unwrapped and uncovered for all to see with all of these risk factors and that this never event happened. Are there other ways that you feel the Christmas holiday effect um, altered or touched on the level of care provided in any way? Did anything else come out in your investigation or in the trial? I, it, it's hard to say um, because everybody would deny that. No, we had enough staff. No, there wasn't a, you know, a failure of of people being available there there that's always going to be denied um but that's you know from my perspective okay fine um that means that i get the same standard of care whether it's christmas eve or you, you know march the third um it should be exactly the same level of care anyway and then they will always say that so i'm happy with that um it's just it's it's all of the things that you mentioned, I have an overrepresentation of cases on the long weekend in July, Thanksgiving weekend, Christmas, Easter. I, like those weekends in particular are really, really difficult. I can't say that the civic holiday has any anything different or new. I can't say that that one's shown up, but the ones that I just listed way overrepresented too many mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's not heart attacks i mean there may be heart attack cases out there i've had had some stroke cases that happen over christmas and new year's mm -hmm. um and maybe a little bit of delay on the part of some of the ones that i've investigated a bit of delay on the part of the individual to go into the hospital that's a worry for covid that people are delaying mm -hmm. going to to hospitals or have been mm -hmm. but um i have to say that I've got so many that happen over all of those holidays. It's um, there's something going on. There is something going on. Yeah, yeah. I would, and I would say within healthcare, um, it's it's known. It's known. It's not liked or necessarily talked about. And I've worked. You know, I worked in a hospital for thirty years and very, very busy labor and delivery units and emergency rooms and medevac flight nurse and you know, when something really shows up, you know, if a woman walks in the door fully and pushing all hands on deck and that baby's going to get delivered. But there's no doubt there is a holiday. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus here because I don't think that even the research has 
nail down specifically what the issues are. You know, as I said, there's a patient perspective and there's patient reasons. And yep. there is also really logical reasons of what's going on in the hospital about the way things are staffed. But the, the mood, um, you know, at Christmas in particular is Christmassy in a hospital. You're not happy that you're there. It is very often uh, junior staff because senior staff get first pick at the holiday off and they've worked a lot of Christmases and now it's their turn to stay home with their family. Um, and, but there's almost always a potluck and maybe a gift exchange and the doctors come out and hang in the nurse's lounge. And there is definitely a holiday spirit. I mean, even in that setting, nurses and doctors are human and you do your best to, you know, celebrate in your own little way while you can. And I've, you know, I can't say that I've ever been part of something that went sideways because we were celebrating any kind of holiday on a hospital unit. But um, I've also heard of many, many cases. And I, I mean, my mom's not the only person. Mm -hmm. My dad had a problem. My sister had a serious problem. And I've seen other lawsuits across the country um, that happen because well, sometimes it's, it's during a staff party. There's been a couple of mental some suicides on mental wards where the staff has been off having a staff party on July 1st. And, you know, it's just eyes off for a little while and something terrible can happen. So, but again, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. I know the reasons are complicated and varied. Um, but I, I like how you just said it, it happens. And it'll be interesting to see more research to see what happens, um, like to see if they, anybody can nail this down. But like, heads up to all of us going into a hospital and heads up to all of us that work in hospitals, um, this is a danger here. You know, there's an increased risk of injury. And I think it's not just in the hospital itself, it's the handover of care to another clinic, another unit, or to home care. And again, my mom's had a hip surgery recently. She was sent home because they got short of beds and they were getting everybody out of the hospital because of COVID. And we were told, yeah, you'll have home care there right away. We didn't see home care for weeks. We didn't see home care for weeks. And luckily we, you know, I have four sisters and a brother and we just pulled together and made it work. So there's also that issue. So we're going to talk about that at the end of the podcast about ways to, you know, do your best job or at least investigate and, and know what you're getting into when you go into a hospital and know what you're getting into when you're going home for the services that you might or might not get to keep yourself safe. So what are the things, what are the things are your memories about this trial? High points and low points um, and any other issues that affected the care that was provided? Yeah, so, I, you know, I thought about the high points and the low points. The high point is when you get the judgment and you won. <laughs> There's nothing mm -hmm. higher than that. Um, the, you know, the reduction in time, like the ability to take, a, a you know, a really, really significant case and um, compress it and be very efficient with the court's time, I, I thought, um, I, I thought about, I, I, when I, I was thinking about this question, I definitely think that. Um, but at the end, okay, so we go to the Court of Appeal. Um, one of the high points was, uh, again, dealing with this causation issue. The other lawyer uh, is standing up making submissions. And I thought, okay, I don't think I've ever had such a double-sided compliment in my life. Um, and there was an issue that came up with the uh, neonatologist. And if the nurse had called the doctor, would the doctor have said, okay, order the bilirubin right away or at the next handling of the baby? And would that have added hours? And, and he, he, he went off, off script a little bit and added another three hours potentially. But I didn't have a report from him to respond to that. So anyway, back in the Court of Appeal, the defense lawyer is saying, well, you know, Ms. Leggett is like one of the most respected medical negligence lawyers in the country. If she didn't ask the question, she didn't want to hear the answer. Oh. And I'm thinking to myself, that wasn't what happened. No. Nope. Um, and I had to hire, I knew that that might be coming, but so I, that I had to hire counsel to argue the appeal with me. And one of the justices on the bench said, well, maybe it's because it wasn't in the report and she couldn't ask the question. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, I'm vindicated. Okay. Uh -huh. So that, that was uh, one of those, yeah, that sounded nice, but it didn't. Um, Cause it made me sound 
quite devious when it, when it wasn't uh, the case. And the other thing was at the end, even though this went to the Court of Appeal and the, it, you know, there's a trial decision, there's a decision from the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal talks about how much money this child um, received. Um, I was very worried about that. I don't like my clients to have the amount of money that they receive exposed even in a even in a, um, a decision and then and because it was a court of appeal and because it was such a notorious kind of case uh, the legal press got a hold of it and one of my colleagues who was participant in this they talked about how much money and i was very worried about that so i asked them to take down any reference to the amounts and um, fair enough that they wanted to talk about the appeal win, but I didn't like that. And so why don't to, you like that talked about, Barb? What's your issue? My issue? Oh my goodness! So um, when it when it comes to representing children um, who are disabled, I, I I don't think that they're they should be exposed on the internet. And all of these things are now on the internet, right? All the cases reports are up on the internet. Whose business is it that they've received a, a, an amount of money? I've had clients where, you know, the family knows you're involved in a lawsuit, so the, the hands are out wanting money. Um, friends are, people want to give you advice, they've got investments. Then there's the children I've represented who um, have brain injuries, but and when they're young, but by the time they hit high school, maybe they're doing not a bad job of having adapted and they've got a bit of a limp, but they know how to, you know, hide it or not be quite so obvious. And, and they learned a lot of subterfuge so that they can be treated like ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So I worry about them. I worry about the mean girls getting hold of this and they become bullied online. Um, that when you have a romantic relationship, you're entitled to tell your partner about your medical history when you're ready to tell that person and trust them with that information. Why should that be out there on the internet? Um, employers will look, you know, and what if they run into it? And you would have been a, a reasonable candidate, but you don't even get the call because they've called you out because of some kind of medical condition. And then there are the, the criminals that are online and look, it's anybody's guess what they're going to come up with. I've, I've, we've had a client in our, our past where a result in the case was posted on something called Canly, which is, it's a good website. You have to go to the website and put terms in that you're looking for in order to find things. It's not Googleable. But what this company did is put, take the, the judgment and put it on another um, website called Worldly, which is Googleable. And then they offered to take it down for 500 US. Oh. And that was, that was not even a serious case like this. And that was over a decade ago, more maybe, I don't know. So what have they been up to in the meantime? Who knows? So yes, I like to protect kids with, um, they're called sealing orders. And every single settlement I get, I attempt to get a sealing order. Mm. That sounds like a really lovely and compassionate um, and, you know, I don't want to say maternal in any bad way, but a mother and a, a protective, a protective way to look after this and, and very opposite from what many other firms do. I mean, these uh, settlements, awards or the damages are posted loud and clear front and center on websites yeah. and billboards. I've just back from the States, a trip to the States and they're just everywhere. So I uh, thank you for that. Thank you for the thoughtfulness that you've put into that and protecting those children throughout their lifetime. Well, you know, um, I have been called a mother bear, so I don't take any umbrage to the, to the maternal um, right. moniker and it, the, speaking of high points, I remember sitting with the trial judge afterward, and you have to, in Ontario and other places, have your fees approved when you represent a child. And um, she's, she, I think a lot of judges believe that we want these sealing orders so that people don't know how much we charge. Mm. I said, you know what? It would be the best thing for my career for lawyers, other lawyers, to know how much I get for my clients. 
it would be the greatest thing for my career. I could put that like, but if you, if you are actually worried about your clients, you don't want that out there. Do the math. You can figure out how much the kid got if you know how much the lawyer was paid. So I, um, I convinced her. She sat there and went, hmm, hadn't thought about it that way hmm. as a marketing tool. And because, of course, judges don't worry about marketing. Um, oh. But uh, I choose not to use it as a marketing tool. Yeah. No, that's right. Do you want to tell us how much you charge? How much do I charge? I charge what everybody else does. <laughs> um, so I call it the red car versus blue car. Most lawyers charge about 25%. Um, in medical negligence, it will be up from that. Um, they just changed things in Ontario so that you now, it used to be you charged a certain percentage on the damages, and now you charge a percentage on the damages plus the costs that were awarded exclusive of your out-of-pocket expenses. Mm. I had a hard time explaining that to people before, and now it's just a nightmare. Um, mm. So uh, 25% is now, if you charge 25% before it's like 22 or something like that, I'd have to get the smart young people in my office who mm. did those calculations for me. Mm. But, but medical negligence is 30, 33%. Um, mm -hmm. cases, I've had cases up to 40 because of the level of risk. Um, Got to remember that in some of these cases where you get tens of millions of dollars the lawyers paid people for years and years and years and expended a lot of money and i can tell you that two million dollars um is is not unusual to have paid out to experts or or just the, the cost to advance the case right. is that what you're saying right. yeah yeah definitely um and do you like trial i love trial you love i trial. love trial yeah. what do you love about it Oh, well, you know, um, I love the intellectual challenge of cross-examining and examining someone else and understanding the medicine so that I can feel confident. And, you know, the example that I gave you, I think another lawyer may not have um, known to go back and say, well, the, you know, the little paint, the, the little walnut should have grown over those four days. Um, those kinds of things come up and you have to have a fairly comprehensive understanding of what you're doing. So that's challenging and interesting. And after 40 years of practice, you do need some challenges. The law is something that is your friend and you understand and sometimes you don't, but uh, the, it's, it's not as difficult. So it's the evidence that's the interesting part and challenging yourself, your own experts, cross-examining other experts, making sure that honest testimony comes out. Um, I really like that. And I, I also like the focus. If I look at my time docket during the course of an in-office day, I may have touched five or six files. It's nice to be in a trial where you're just thinking about one. Mm -hmm. Or certainly from my experience, like I said, the word on the street when I, I hear from other lawyers that you're one of the best in the country, Barb. And from a personal level, um, you were one of the, like, I'm always blown away by how much medicine you lawyers have to learn when you do a med mal case. I'm, I always learn something from every lawyer I've ever worked with. I feel, you know, confident that I can teach and add my knowledge, but I always have to look deeper than what my knowledge is and learn more than I ever knew. So you were lovely to work with. And I think, you know, for everybody listening and or watching you, this was you in trial. I mean, you sitting in your chair right now was just you in trial as well. I felt, I felt a calmness and a confidence and articulation in the words that you spoke and your knowledge. So I could see that you were at home there. You know, it's not like I've seen other lawyers and they've been so nervous and sweaty and have to pee 35 times. You know, I've had that experience. And you were just exactly as you are right now, uh, was my recollection, is that you, you were very much at home. You know, that's your... That's your place to be. Are you um, are you able to share with us how this little one is doing now, the little boy? Well, he was profoundly physically disabled, had hearing loss, um, so it it was a you know as as, as it set out in the um, the cases. But um, one of the things that is a tragedy about Cornicterus, and it's it's hard to unearth, is that the cognitive disability 
it, it's often thought that the intellect is preserved and that it's really more of a, a motor kind of uh, CP condition. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and I do keep in touch with a lot of um, my clients. Um, it, that's one of the nice things. I have some beautiful artwork from some of the kids on my walls. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful kids. They have great parents who are dedicated to them. It's, it's, it's just great to keep in touch with them. Mm, Nice. Nice. So right before, um, I, I didn't know this, but I know it now since we've been talking since that time, right before this Gassy V. Singh trial, you ran another trial and you talked about the incredible experience of those two trials being back to back and you joked that it was the best weight loss program of the time, <laughs> at the time, weight loss program over the holidays. Tell us a little bit about that other case as much as you can and about the experience of running two back to back medical malpractice trials. We become very focused and efficient and you have to have juniors, uh, you know, one junior on one trial and the other one sort of in the background and the other. Although um, it was a pretty busy Christmas season for me because before uh, the the, the TS and Addy case was litigated in late November into December and then the Gyasi case just started, started, I think it was the 23rd of January. So there was not a lot of time to uh, get prepared um, on the fly. You had to do a lot of work ahead of time. So the year ahead of that was a lot of work. Um, and I, I, I had a great time with the, the TS and Addy case because of the counsel who were on the other side. Um, the trial judge, and this is unusual for a trial that is a significant case where there was liability of both of two two doctors and uh, an obstetrician and um, a radiologist so uh, the the counsel were terrific and during the trial we had issues but the judge did not have to rule on anything other than the final judgment and that's very very unusual the the gassy case that you were involved in, there were lots of times the trial judge had to intervene and make rulings, but this other trial, we worked it all out and it was a very uh, issue focused and she was very complimentary at the end. So from the perspective of a judge, I just heard the evidence that I needed to hear. I had the documents I needed to look at and uh, was then able to come up with a decision. Boom, that sounds pretty positive. What are the facts of that case? So that was a, a, a case involving a failure to uh, appreciate what was on an, uh, the anatomic ultrasound. So the anatomic ultrasound is a case, or is, is done um, at about 20 weeks, maybe a little before, a little after. And that's to, um, you know, basically look at the anatomy of the child to determine if there are any potential negative outcomes that can be addressed at that point in time. The time of the anatomic ultrasound is important because, um, first of all, the the baby is developed enough that you can see the structures that you need to see, fingers and toes and hands and heart chambers and the brain and the orbits of the eyes, all of those kinds of things do circumferences of heads to see if there's, you know, microcephaly, that all of those important, important things. And it's also done um, in Ontario and in Canada in the main. This was, this was very inter- interesting for me to find out because viability of, of a fetus happens at presumably about 24 weeks. So if a woman is going to be faced with a choice of terminating a pregnancy she needs to know in advance of 24 weeks because after that, um, after viability, it's a bit iffy. So um, the learning that I had to come up with over the course of that trial was, uh, and in anticipation of that trial was unexpected. um, And it was unexpected for the trial judge we think of Canada as a very liberal place and uh, that, that we have liberal abortion laws. 
there is actually no abortion law per se in Canada. And um, the only the only case that really was important for our understanding was the Morgenthaler case. And for those who don't know, that was a doctor who believed that um, termination of pregnancy should be taken out of the back room. And he continued to have um, an, a clinic in Montreal and was, was criminally charged several times and juries would not convict him. And so the book, they, they left him alone and went off the books. But during the course of that trial, uh, or that case, the Supreme Court of Canada weighed in and basically said there may come a time when the state has an interest in termination of pregnancies, um, but it would be at a point that would be after viability. So after viability, it requires, um, there, there has to be some kind of process in place for uh, for hospitals and doctors to determine whether or not one um, could take place. So this case was all about missing something very, very significant in an anatomic ultrasound that was done at 20 weeks. There was plenty of time. Um, interestingly, it was done um, over between Christmas and New Year's. <laughs> Um, and the the uh, the radiologist uh, missed some things. The um, obstetrician, not even sure whether he saw it, um, but it, it it was overlooked. And I learned that what for radiologists and obstetricians, when they're looking at that anatomic ultrasound, if there's going to be a genetic disorder, they say it's all in the hands and feet. And there was actually a program at Mount Sinai called It's All in the Hands and Feet um, about, about this case. And, and this child's hand in the, in the womb was bent and didn't move. And that was to them extremely significant. I examined and cross-examined so many people with my hand in that, in that position that by the end of the trial, actually my wrist ached. It, it was uh, one of those things I couldn't stop from doing. <laughs> You're a good lawyer, Barb, really. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you, and you were talking about weight loss. I mean, it's important that, like, uh, I, I drop weight during a trial. I think it's because you, you don't eat. And I heard one lecture once, uh, uh, how, to, how to be a second chair and how to protect your lawyer. One is make sure they eat. Sure. Um, that's actually kind of important because you're just, you're work, 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 working all the time. And stress, right? Yeah. So I had this one before the holidays drop some weight, put a little bit back on another trial, dropped it again. It's um, great, a, a great way <laughs> if you're worried about that. Yeah, for sure. There's some other good Christmas advice. We're going to talk about what not to do in the hospital over Christmas. But if you want to lose some weight, you know, run a couple of trials. I think there's stress eaters and there's stress not eaters too. I'm like you, I'm a stress not eater. I will lose weight during times of stress. But I know lots of people who just eat lots. I mean, that's how they kind of calm, keep themselves calm during during times of stress. So anyway, interesting case. Um, and how did that one turn out? What What happened? Well, that one turned out very well, uh, again, for, for the uh, client, it was successful. Um, and it, it, it was, uh, it was a very interesting trial, because the uh, one of the theories of the defendant was that, well, you know, if she couldn't get it, she found out about this well after 24 weeks, she was well into, you know, six, seven months, and had to deliver the baby. Um, Nobody suggested to her that she could go to the States to have termination and um, that that became a big, I think, red herring side issue. But I did some research on, a, on something called the Wayback Machine, and that's where you can go to websites that, to, to see what a website actually looked like in 2009 or 2007. And this, a name of a particular place in the States was identified as a place you could go. Well, just before this baby was born, or when this was all going on, when she would have had to make this decision, there was news about um, a, an obstetrician who was, doing, who was ter terminating pregnancies being shot uh, to death mm -hmm. in his church while he was giving out uh, pamphlets. 
Yeah. And another one advertising that it had, it was in a remote location. They had bulletproof glass. They had all of these protections. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. You're going to go to the States in that environment. Like if you could fly to Colorado or wherever this was, it was, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. And then the, uh, the physician who was testified on behalf of the defendant was himself, um, he had never performed a termination of a pregnancy because he, he, it was against his beliefs. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a a fair amount of cross-examination about, about his bias. So the baby was delivered at some point, like labor delivery, vaginal delivery sort of situation. Yeah. And viable or not? Viable. um, The, it, it was like a thalidomide child mm-hmm. uh, with the the first survived child. yes happy yes. little girl very mm-hmm. very happy family and another family I, i'm happy to say that i keep in touch with over christmas and, mm-hmm. and see mm-hmm. how they're doing and see how they're uh, they're managing their life with the with fewer pressures on them yeah good my goodness i was i was saying to my clients you know i wish i at the end of the day all i can do is get you money yeah um and I wish I could do more. I really do. But uh, at the end of the day, that's all I can do. And some, sometimes that relieves some stresses. Oh, I know it does. I know it does. Of course, it takes a big worry off, a big worry off. So let's shift gears a little bit now. There's a couple more questions I'd like to ask you. I've still got a few minutes. Um, I'm always fascinated in <clears throat> the... Um, when medical malpractice lawyers who know stuff like you know, and and your own family or your personally enter into the healthcare system and i know i mean you and i don't know each other well but we keep in touch now and then and i hear about you from mutual friends and i know that some of your own family members have entered into the healthcare system over the last few years based on the work that you do uh what's it like for you personally entering into the healthcare system when you know what you know about the worst potential outcomes. I'm uh, uh, all I know is I'm glad I didn't do this work when I was becoming a mother, and it's bad enough <laughs> becoming a grandmother and being in my you know the my daughter's uh, delivery room, um, and you know knowing about two vessel cords versus three vessel cords, and uh, it's just just it's terrifying to be quite honest. And I can't help but take a look at the fetal monitors, and I can't help but you know, take a peek at the charts. Um, That's certainly in the baby context. My own mother, like yours, I mean, she's in her 90s. I've been to the hospital with her once or twice, let me tell you. And um, I've, I've learned to be that patient or that, you know, that patient's person um, to be an advocate and ask questions and, and say, oh, isn't that interesting? Or what, you know, when was the last time you did my mom's blood work? how is it you know it, I, I ask the question mm-hmm. that I think is important um whether it is or it isn't but it, it uh it, I think it's important for medical personnel to know that there's somebody who's watching and I've been asked many yeah. times are, are you a medical professional like, because of the questions that I ask um and at one point I thought, you know, no, I'm not going to tell them what I really do. And then I thought, yeah, I'm going to tell them what I really do. <laughs> <laughs> that improves care. I'm good with that. Yeah. I'll tell you without a shadow of a doubt, there'll be a big red star put somewhere on your mom's or your daughter's or somebody's. The fact that you're in the room and you're a med mal lawyer, um, uh, that will get you some you know, maybe not better care, but certainly a, a more attention and attention to care because that yeah. puts everybody on high alert. I know working in a labor and delivery unit, when a lawyer of any kind came into the hospital to have a baby, that, you know, they got a couple of big red asterisks beside their name on the, on the, on the leaderboard. Cause we're like, well, you know, when my, my daughter had her first child, I remember talking to Kevin Ross, who's uh, at Learners and, and, uh, I said, you know, she she received standard of care. Like she, it mm-hmm. was it was really excellent care. Um, I I saw the handoff done, but you know, I she was running a temperature. She got antibiotics. Like that, it was 
really well done. I like that the handoff was done beautifully and they mm -hmm. sat there and, and, and looked at her. They looked at what was going on. I, they never left her side. So I, I said, you know, I, I really got standard of care. And he said, well, they probably knew who you were. And I said, yeah. she's got a different last name. No, 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 no. They didn't know who you were. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but I'm glad you got standard of care. I'm just glad oh, for it, that. It, yeah, it, it, it was stellar. Very, very, yeah, very, very yeah. Nice. I always make a point of it too, you know, because I've been with my daughter having two babies in the last few years, and I've been at a hospital that knew exactly who I was because I worked there for 13 years. Um, but I think, you know, I, I'm not going to be a pain in the ass for anybody, but I, my eyes are on everything that's going on, and I'm glad that you all know that, you know. It's so, so important. If you see some things, you know, you've got to, you can be polite and ask a, a question, yeah. but it's hard to sit back and pretend. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it isn't yeah. good. So based on the experiences that you've been through, is there anything you would change? I mean, you know, the whole legal side of it and the medical malpractice side of it, and you know, the very personal side of it, you know, your family, your daughter having babies, your mom being in the hospital. Are there things you would change if you could about health and healthcare in Canada? Yeah, um, systemically, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, what I see are, are two big, big things. One is a cognitive bias that I've seen this before. I know what this is without thinking through the symptoms, thinking through the history, thinking through what tests or whatever ought to be done. And so that, that cognitive bias about or, or minimizing uh, a, a symptom that it's probably just this um, is what is one area where I see medical professionals get into trouble, at least from my perspective. I'm sure mm -hmm. that day to day that's not something, but the things that I see are that that's a failing. I would and have to say that was probably a part in the Gassy trial as well. I mean, you just see jaundice all the time, every day. And exactly. I mean, personally, as a nurse, I have never seen jaundice progress to connectoris. I've learned more about connectoris as a medical expert than I ever did in 30 years of hospital bedside, baby, newborn, neonatal care. It just doesn't happen. You know it's out there, but it never, ever, ever happens. But I think that's because, you know, you see the yellow baby and you order the test and that's all there is to it. So um, you're very right on that. You're very right. You know things can happen, but they don't happen on your watch, you know? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's something that people need to, uh, I mean, we all do um, mm -hmm. in every profession. And the other is communication. The, the, the hot spots are transfer of care, um, communication amongst a team. Um, it, and there can be, unfortunately, I think ego on both sides of, uh, in, I'm talking about the hospital environment now um, where the physician may poo-poo what the nurse tells them or the nurse uh, hesitates to tell or the nurse thinks the resident doesn't know what the resident's doing. So it, it, there can be breakdowns in communication because of those interpersonal issues, for okay. sure. Um, but it's transfer of care, like you said, moving from one floor to the next, moving from one ward to the next, the, the turnover of staff. I mean, July 1st is not a day I would want to be in a hospital because of the, you know, in a teaching hospital because of the new residents. The day before you had somebody who had at least a year under their belt. And today you've got somebody who's like, where's the bathroom and when do yeah. I get one? Green as uh, grass, green as yeah, grass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's that's not a time that I think, I'm, I'm sure that the, the seasoned staff go, oh my gosh, here we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've got this crop of newbies. Um, but it's it's the communication that, that happens and hesitance you know, on the part of uh, maybe residents to, to quote, bother the attending. Mm -hmm. I've heard nurses testify, well, if I called the doctor every time something like that happened, they'd be down my throat. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's a significant um, matter, then I guess you, you it's part of the job. Um, yeah. And hopefully there is better communication and you don't, uh, you aren't in a position of fearfulness. 
Yeah. The other areas is um, training. It must be um, intimidating, exhausting uh, to have to have the level of expertise and knowledge, and it's constantly changing and that sort of thing that that uh, physicians and nurses and other health professionals have to have. It, it's it's uh, admirable the amount of time that I think. Uh, good professionals do put into their work, but it's also um, something that's necessary. And uh, to those who don't keep up um, with how to, you know, look at any FM tracing, electronic fetal monitor tracing, who don't um, know what the, the changes mean and why you're putting someone on their side or when to give oxygen or when mm -hmm. to turn the oxytocin down, all that sort of thing. Um, if you're not keeping up with it, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, good point. That's a really good point. And there's a lot of that that goes on. I just read some examination for discovery documents in, uh, three hours a couple of days ago. And there's a nurse in there who just had so little knowledge. It was shocking, um, but loved her job. And she'd done nothing but that for 40 years, nothing but labor and delivery for 40 years. And I was just like, it's just a matter of time until this happened just a matter of time because you don't understand the physiology behind what you're doing and how to correct it and how to recognize, how to interpret the information. But um, those are all excellent points. What, um, and I think research backs a lot of what you just said. There's, you know, communication is still, you know, they say 70% of malpractice lawsuits and adverse events have some communication error involved. What would you change if you could about malpractice law in Canada? from the outside and as you're in your profession as a lawyer? Yeah, so um, I think we have a pretty good system of law here in, in Canada. And I think that, that, that we should be very proud of it. Very, very proud of it. We have an independent judiciary. We have a, a, an independent bar. Um, we have excellent legal training. And um, the pandemic has dragged us into this century when it comes to the, you know, use of electronic means of, of, of delivery of documents and, and, and just it, that's a whole other area that I'm sure that uh, you could have a podcast about. But at the end of the day, you need a judge and a clerk and the lawyers in the same environment, be it Zoom or in a courtroom, to litigate the cases. And we don't have enough of the judges and the clerks to go around. We are very, very under-resourced for, a, a, you know, it's one of our branches of government that has to go begging to the government for fin financing to get new judges and space and all the rest of it. And um, that's leading to delays in trials being conducted. And, you know, these things, not only do they hang over my clients' heads, but they hang over the, the medical professionals involved. Mm -hmm. And it's unfair to absolutely everyone involved. If you're ultimately going to be vindicated or you're really being kept in as a bit player, um, why should you have to deal with this thing on your record and put it on your, your request for privileges for five years running or six years running or if there's an appeal even longer? Our system needs to get expedited um, mm -hmm. a, a lot, not a bit, but a lot. Uh, and, and somehow that, I think at its root, is personnel. Yeah. Are you hopeful that that's going to happen soon? I don't know. Uh, at the provincial level, see, the problem is, too, that it's a bit Byzantine. And, and uh, the, because the provinces supply the courtrooms and the staff and that sort of thing, the chief justice has to go to the to the provincial level to make the request, and then that goes to the federal level because they actually appoint the federal judges, and then it has to be in the budget. So, you know, it's a long, long process. I did see in Ontario, for example, that at the provincial level, which is a completely different level, doesn't do the medical negligence cases. They're they're adding a lot of um, clerks and judiciary, but we need it at the we need it at the superior court level across the country. Yeah. You're not the only person I've heard that from. You know, certainly no. that's, that's a complaint, You're just like you said, across the country. Well, I'm going to um, ask you one more question, Barb, and I end every podcast by asking the same question. 
Um, and then we'll wrap up. And if we have time, go on to a shorter podcast where we're going to talk about you on a more personal level. But um, if you would answer this question for three different audiences, for doctors and nurses, healthcare providers, for other lawyers, and for the general public, the question is, what is the most important thing that they need to know about medical malpractice? Let's start with what's the most important thing that healthcare providers need to know about medical malpractice? That you're not a real healthcare provider until you've been sued and don't sweat it. <laughs> Damn, no one's going to want to hear that. <laughs> no, um, just write stuff down and make sure you've communicated uh, for sure. Um, you, you, you really have to be clear in your communication, both written and verbal, um, but don't sweat it. I think, you know, you're not a real doctor until you've been sued. I've told my friends that, and then they've helped me, oh, okay, I have been sued. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, and let's talk to the audience of lawyers. Um, what's the most important thing you'd like lawyers to know about medical malpractice, other lawyers to know about medical malpractice? Well, if you're not doing it, don't do it until you do it with someone, or you've got a lot of trial experience in complicated cases. I, for myself, I had practiced about 15 years before I went into medical negligence, and I'd done some complicated trials. So, and and I, there was still a very, very steep learning curve. You have to be prepared to spend an enormous amount of time learning medicine, and you have to be prepared to spend an enormous amount of money. Um, uh, staff, experts, exhibits, that kind of thing. It's not for the faint of heart. It is not for people who think, oh, well, I'll just issue this claim and, and uh, they'll negotiate with me. And the other big mistake I think uh, that too many lawyers make is that they, they focus on did something go wrong without thinking about the causation component, which is right. where a lot of cases are won and lost. Right, right. Good advice. And what about for the general public? What's the most important thing you'd like them to know about medical malpractice? Go to somebody who knows what they're doing. They <laughs> Don't go to your real estate lawyer. Don't go to your family <laughs> lawyer um, unless you're going and asking them for a recommendation for a medical negligence lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. We are not all created equally. Do not come to me for a real estate deal. Do not mm -hmm. come to me if you're getting a divorce. I'm not your person. Um, and similarly, if you have a medical negligence case, go to a, a specialist, someone who is competent to, to deal with your case, because yeah. you could be very disappointed and it could be very expensive for you too. Yes, that is really great advice right there. Every once in a while, as you know, we supply experts for lawyers across the country. And every once in a while, we get a call from someone who's who's done exactly what you said. They just found a case that they thought might be good and it looks like <clears throat> it'll be easy and it'll be big money and it scares everybody when that phone call comes in we're scared for the lawyer we're scared for the plaintiff we're scared to connect them with any experts to you know to give them to a completely unexperienced lawyer and so i even often do that you know once you sort of get a sense that they really don't have any idea what they're doing advise them to seek out some cold counsel and point them in the direction of more experienced people at least to make the call because, um, and I know they don't ever like that, but I'm like, this isn't good for anybody. This isn't good for anybody for them to try that. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we wrap up? Well, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's about all I would have to say. My grandchildren are downstairs waiting for me to make Christmas cookies. So, oh. um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's very important part of this Saturday afternoon. I have just a short wrap up and because, um, and then we'll finish up for this one. And I just, so much, so I'm so grateful to you, Barb, your, your calm demeanor, your wealth of knowledge, your open sharing of the stories and your knowledge and your insights in these cases has been fascinating. Thank you for your time. But I mean, I never want the goal of this podcast to be to frighten or shock or terrorize anybody. And because we opened this podcast with some troubling stats on the increased risk of injuries in hospitals during holidays and weekends, and because the Christmas season is upon us, 
And because some of you who are listening to this right now or your family members may end up in a healthcare facility over the holidays, and because the purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform, not to frighten, I want to leave you with some practical information to help you ask the right questions, to advocate for the care you deserve, and to facilitate facilitate the safest hospital stay you could if you end up there over the holidays. Now, before you go in the hospital, if you can, if the opportunity arrives, ask some questions. You might have to find the head of the unit that you'll be on or the doctor or the um, hospital administrator, depending on where it is you're going. But talk to them, if you can, about their hospital uh, staff coverage. Do they rotate to avoid staff burnout? Do they keep senior staff on? Um, to oversee the less experienced staff who might be there? Are senior level physicians, nurses, and therapists there to balance out the less experienced staff? What is their nurse to patient ratio? Um, If they cut down on staff, do they also close some of their beds? Do they have clear and enforced policies regarding how long a patient should wait for diagnostic testing, such as ultrasound lab, CT scan, or MRI? Or are these withheld over the holidays? What is the maximum amount of time planned for discharge or transfer if an alternate level of care is required? Just do your best if you can. And I know this is sometimes an impossible task because you end up in the ER and you're there and there's no time for this. But if there's something planned over the holidays and you can ask these kinds of questions, what's the flow? Who's going to be there? How are you going to be left after? If you need testing, how's it going to happen? And where might you be transferred to if your injuries are more serious? During your hospital stay, ask a lot of questions. Take advice from Barb and be a mama bear. Don't be afraid to ask. There is an art to asking without anger and without alienating people, but ask. Don't sit quiet and wonder and hope and worry. Always have a list of current medications with you, whether it's for yourself or a loved one um, that you're caring for. Don't be afraid to ask the nurse what medications he or she is giving you because med errors are ubiquitous in hospital care. Make it a point to ask healthcare providers, who are they? Um, I mean, I've tried to ask the cleaning lady some stuff before and she'll just say like, I'm not not your nurse, but sometimes everybody's in a uniform and you don't really know. Ask ask that young doctor, if you're there on July 1st, ask that, are you a doctor? Are you a medical resident? Are you a student? Are you here on your first day? Ask them who they are, what their designation is, and what part they plan to play in your care. Um, Have someone stay with you as much as you can, all eyes on. I mean, if me and Barb were out for hire, we'd be two awesome people to have with you, but we're not out for hire. But where you can, um, have a Have a really astute friend or family member who can stay with you, particularly in these times of COVID demand cleanliness. Don't hesitate to ask someone to stick on some gloves or to wipe down a dirty surface or to disinfect their hands before they touch you. Again, you can do it kindly, but clearly. Have an idea what your hospital itinerary might be. What, what are you, why are you there? What's going to be done? How long can you expect it to be admitted? What kind of um, testing and consultations are taking place? And be sure that someone lets you know when and if those goals of care change. You might want to have someone take notes by the bedside, um, take notes on what each prov- care provider has talked about and what the next steps will be and when they're going to happen. Because there's sometimes a whole lot of waiting that goes on in a hospital, waiting for the next doctor to show up or the next test to be performed. And if you're discharged over the holiday season, when it is known to be a risky, higher risk season to be readmitted or to suffer injury or death, be sure to follow up on community supports and home care and discharge appointments to ask if those services are even available over holiday weekends, particularly now that COVID is affecting um, so many services. Find out what services are there, how you can access them, and when they'll be available to provide you some help at home. Can I add one thing? Yeah, please. One thing that I I think is very important and I've learned um, personally and, and professionally is don't assume that the, the health professional who's walking into the room has all of the information about your loved one or you. 
I know that I've repeated to um, many, many health professionals, my mother's long list of conditions. It's not just the list of medications, but it's the list of diagnoses and conditions. And that uh, from time to time has changed the treatment, uh, the treatment plan. I do that with my own family doctor. I'm going to say, you remember that we talked about this and, and she'll go, oh yeah, yeah. And let me look that note up because they don't have you know, steel trap mines and they're mm -hmm. seeing tons and tons of people. I don't think anybody's offended by a straightforward, I just want to let you know, you may or may not know this about mom or my child or whomever. Just give them a heads up. They don't want to hear it. That's their problem. But you've done um, what you can to, to bring them up to up to speed. Yeah, that's a really great piece of advice. Thanks so much for throwing that in. That's really good. Anything else on your mind? Uh, no, that, that, that's my big one. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. I could hear those adorable grandkids. I know. The they're in the background. And the, the, yeah. I did some advanced uh, peanut butter balls on the counter. So nice they're job. Probably wanting, they're wanting to roll them in uh, chocolate by now. Or else they're all gone. Yeah. <laughs> Well, with that, uh, thank you again so much, Barb. We'll sign off for this podcast. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And we're going to try to get back. We'll see how this cookie baking venture goes. But we're going to try to get back either later today or maybe tomorrow to um, record a shorter podcast called Just About Barb Leggett, where you'll get to hear her talk about why she chose malpractice law as a profession, how she spends her time off when she's not busy doing what she does, what kind of things keep her up at night, and what advice she has to offer for younger lawyers and her younger self. So don't miss that. So once again, Barb, thank you, and uh, take good care. Thank you.